The key is to serving Jesus Christ is this. Be content, the Bible says, in all things. All things. And every married couple said amen. amen. That was real weak. Every married couple said amen. amen. Be content. Amen. I don't feel like it. Be content in all things. And I, I, there's one guy, man. He loves that. He loves that. And I know Ken. And uh, I love Ken. You know, I want to talk to you about something that is so awesome. This is not the topic of my message, but I just want to intro this. But isn't God's grace incredible? God's grace. Think about God's grace. He loves you through your sin. And he loves you. Doesn't matter what. He will take you. He will take me. Just exactly how we presented it ourselves to God. God's grace is so incredibly deep, wide, high. It is huge. We can't even fathom God's grace. Think about it. Hitler did not receive or Hitler did not deserve God's grace. But if he would have looked up to God, on his last day and said, God, Jesus, I give my heart to you. God would have accepted him. Think about that. That despicable man of a human being, God would have taken him even though he killed so many of his children, the Jews. Let that sink in. The grace surpasses anything that we can think of. And all I can say is it's a great thing that God is God and not me. Because there's no way I would want a, a person like a Hitler to go to heaven. heaven. But there's this grace that God loves us so much that he looks beyond our faults. And he sees truly who you really are. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. You can't hide anything from God. But this grace is a gift. It is a gift to Christ followers. And there's a huge difference between Christians and Christ followers today. And this is a gift to us. But the problem with most gifts is it, it gets abused. This thing called grace. Today, the modern day church has abused it. And it's really sad because God, even the Apostle Paul talks about this. And I, I encourage you to read chapter six this week of Romans. Um. And even as the Apostle Paul is talking about grace and tells us how to maneuver through grace and what grace is really for. But Romans 2 or 6, 1 says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Because, you know, if you're a Christ follower, you once were a sinner saved by grace. Grace. So if we want grace in our lives, should we then go on sinning so it will increase? And he, with an um, explanation point, by no means, nothing like that. We are those who have died to sin. How many has died to sin? Amen? We have died to sin. It is behind us. There's everything I came from that put me in chains. Why in the world would I want to go back to it? Why in the world would I want to go back to even a little bit of it? And here it says, we are those who have died of sin. How can we live in it any longer? You know, most people come to Jesus Christ 
because they've hit a, a dead end in their lives. And I get it. I lived in the world for a little bit. And even in Hebrews chapter 11, it says that for a season, it's fun. And it was fun. I don't know about you. I'll be, I'll admit it. Bunch of you self-righteous people here. It was fun. And absolutely, man, the devil knows how to shake it up good. Absolutely. What, I've, what I realized about sin, it looked better than it tasted. It looked better than I par- as I participated in it. And finally, that's where the, in my life, where the, you know, the fork in the road came. Did I want to keep going to this way? Because I've partaced, I, I participated in it, and it's not tasting good. It's not feeling good. It makes me feel a certain way. It's fun for a while. But all of a sudden, it came to a dead end. And that's what the Bible says. Some people, it takes six months. Some people, it takes 20 years. Some people, it takes 40 years. Finally, something triggers why they turn to Jesus. And some people are so much in their stubbornness of that sin that they, they want to hang on to it, and they hang on to it right to hell. But it doesn't matter how you came to Jesus Christ, the question I have for you, what you did before, are you trying to justify today? Just a thought. Now Romans goes on and says in 617, thank God once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from that slavery and he calls it right out. Slavery is a bondage. It's in, you're in chains, slavery to sin. And you have become slaves to righteous living. Hallelujah. Amen? 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 Slaves to righteous living. What's righteous living look like? Righteous living looks like to be more like Jesus. I love that bracelet. Remember that bracelet that came out years ago? What would Jesus do? Yeah. I don't know if you ever ask yourself that question when temptation comes your way. What would Jesus do? To become slaves. Because what he's trying to say here is that everybody is slave to something. So either you're a slave to sin or you're a slave to righteousness. And he is saying, become slaves to righteous living. I want you to know something. If you haven't figured this out yet, it's pretty obvious. If you've been in the Christian or Christ follower circles for years, it's pretty obvious that the modern day church today has has and is abusing grace. And even back then, they abused grace. And that's why Paul was telling the church, the Roman church, speaking to the Christians, get your act together and stop abusing the grace. Well, guess what? Every one of us, somehow, some way, has abused grace. Starting with me to you. All of us, somehow, some way, have abused grace. And God doesn't want that. He is saying there is a different way to walk. But when you do that abuse, is there something there to take you out of it? Or do you fall deeper into it? When so-called Christians, Christ followers, say to me, if I barely make it into heaven by the skin of my teeth, I'm good. What they're really saying to me is that they're not totally sold out for Jesus. 
what they're really saying to me is that they're willing, they're not willing to give up their pleasures, and I, hopefully I can do this without falling. They want to live right there, right on the edge. Because they're not totally willing to carry their cross for Jesus. Because they're totally willing not to die on that cross for Jesus. They're totally willing and not to literally surrender all that they have for Jesus. It'd be no different from a man saying, I hope my wife lets me in the house tonight because I've been with another woman. Because I've been unfaithful. It's a double standard. Many Christians live a double standard. Many Christ followers, they, they, they live one foot in the church and one foot in the world. You know, there are some religions that teach that you can do what you want Monday through Saturday. You come to church and, man, you, you uh, take some sacraments and you do some things and, man, you're good. You're good. Where in the world does that say that in the Bible? If you can show me, I'll give you $10 million. I'll give you $100 million. Oh, man, I'll give you a billion. Isn't that true? It's so twisted. It's so twisted. But see, people like that. Because people want to live on the edge. Don't tell me what I can and can't do. And they don't even realize, some of them do and some of them don't, that they're abusing grace. They're abusing the cross. They're abusing the crucifixion. They're nailing Jesus to the cross again and again, Hebrews talks about. And it's something that we don't live a double standard. And, but the church today would rather have their ears itched than told the truth. And it's interesting because the Bible is saying that in these last days, this was going to happen in 2 Timothy 4, 3, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look. See, think about this. 100 years ago, we didn't have all these churches. 50 years ago, a little bit more, there was a church on every street corner. There was a church, if, if you don't want that pastor to talk about this, and you go to another church and that, oh, finally you hop around, people hop around, hop around. Okay, I, I like you because you're not talking about my weaknesses. You're not talking about... Uh, my sins, and I, I like what you, you're saying. I like this church. <laughs> the Bible said this almost a couple thousand years ago, oh, yeah. that in the last days, they didn't know there would be a church on every street corner. And in the last days, they will reject the truth. But then it goes on. They will follow their own desires, look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear, and then they will reject the truth. Chase after myths, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling, speaking, the word this year is speak. Work at speaking to others about the what? The good news of Jesus Christ. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Speak it. Ephesians 6 talks about fearlessly, that we fearlessly speak it. And then it goes on, fully carry out the ministry God has given you. What ministry has God given you? What ministry has God given me? Whatever that ministry is, do it unto the Lord. But it's saying that in the last days, there's an itch. Itching ears. There's an itch going on. Question for you. 
This is going to be interesting. Don't yell it out. Just ponder it to yourself. Do you want the Holy Spirit to encourage you or to convict you? Hmm. Most people will lean to encouragement because who doesn't love to be encouraged? I love to be encouraged. Amen? Man, after Sunday services are done and so on, I go to Tammy, and now here's the big test. Tammy, how was it? And if she says, it was awesome. Woo! I'm ready to buy her a bunch of shoes and <laughs> dresses, whatever she wants. Here's a bank account. Go for it, babe. I love encouragement from Tammy. I love it. Because we're made that way. Our hearts are tickled that way. I want you to tell me my strengths. I don't want you to talk about my weaknesses. You start talking about my weaknesses? You know, this world, this world does, they dwell on their strengths. They don't dwell on their weaknesses. You can, you can do it. You're confident. Look what you've done. You're all that. What does that do to you? Puffs you up. Jesus said in John 16, 8, when he comes, meaning the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment. I'm trying to look for Encouragement. Convict. It's all about in regards to sin, righteousness, judgment. If I'm always told, you're all that, you're great, you're wonderful, you can do everything through you that strengthens you, I'm not going to mature. I'm not going to grow up. I, I, I'm not going to go far in my marriage. Because, see, I'm going to think that, wow, Tammy, she has a good, look at who she married. <laughs> I know, men, you think, you think that anyway, but, you know. We won't depend on God. We won't depend on Jesus Christ. There's no need for Jesus in our lives. All we have is ourself, and that's all we need. Be careful about that word encouragement. Even in the scriptures, when you tear it down in the Hebrew or Greek, it means a lot different than what you think. Because the Holy Spirit has come to convict. He's come to convict us of our sin, of the, our righteousness. Are we self-righteous? Are we walking a righteous life before God? Are we living out a righteous life? Are we practicing what we say? You think that just applies to me? That applies to you and what you're saying to your children. That applies to you and what you're saying to your wife or your, your husband or your co-workers. He is wanting to stir something up in us, to push us. And that leads me to the scripture today. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how we may, say that word with me, spur one another on towards love. Good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all more, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The day's approaching, folks. I 
I really didn't know. I felt like God, God gave me this message, this thought that's been stirring in my heart probably since last October. Now, I didn't know exactly when I was going to share it, but God wanted me to share it today. And, and he just told me, he goes, I, I want you to share your shepherd's heart. I want you to share your shepherd's concern for my people, for my flock, for his church. And God is saying, I need to spur my people on. And he's telling us to spur each other on. That's what this scripture is. And he's telling me to spur you on as I always do and I always will do. And he's telling you to spur on your maid. He's telling you to spur on your children. He's telling you to spur on mom and dad. He's telling you to spur on a coworker. You to spur on a college student. You to spur on people that even you call enemy, spur them on. And then he says in this scripture, encouraging, uses that word encouraging, but if you looked at it in the Greek, the Greek meaning is warn people. Warn them. Because the day is approaching. Warn them about the truth. Don't sit in your coffee clutches with these people and listen to them when you know you're dealing with somebody of the world and you're listening to them. Don't agree with them. Don't agree. There's nothing that the world has right. Just know that. And also, they're not in my circle. They're not my, they're not my like friends' friends, if you know what I'm talking about. They're people that I'm on a mission to see the love of Jesus come within their hearts. I'm on a mission. And I don't care what their feelings are towards me. I don't care what they think. All I know is I'm here. I'm going to spur them on. You show me a scripture that I need to be friends with the world. There is nothing like that. Don't agree with the world. Spur them on in truth. Because it all comes back not to your truth, my truth, but it's only one truth. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Spur. When I think of spur, oh, yes. I think of a saddle. Spur. You know, it's been a long time before my back went out a few years ago. Uh, I did some horseback riding. Never wore the spurs, though. They just told me, kick, kick, kick that horse. Get it going. You know, but the horse is all about direction. You know, that bit in their mouth and taking that rein. And, and then you have these things that that would not feel good on the backside. Spurring, just spurring that horse on. It may, is making that horse go in what? His direction? No, the direction you want to go. God is wanting us to spur people on to go his direction, not your direction, not their direction. His direction is only one way. And the horse, it's, it's amazing how it will take commands. It will obey. It will be submissive a lot better than human beings half the time. But there is a direction, there is a control uh, when it comes to dealing with a horse, when you sit on that saddle and, and, and all of this. And, it, and you know, it, it's fun riding a horse and all that. But there's reasons about the spur that it needs to get things going. It needs to get things in the right direction. And understand that the, the, the spur in the Greek meaning means stimulate, provoke. And I like this word, irritation. It's an irritation. And I want you to get, I'm going to talk a lot about that one word, irritation. What irritates you? It's an irritation. Oh, I got all kinds of irritations. 
things that irritate. But I, but I just want to keep talking about this word spur, this Greek word, this irritation. And they say in the Greek that it's like having rat, like a rash on your hand. And then, man, it starts to irritate. Then you're scratching it. And you're scratching it. And, and well, it'll go away. A week later, you're, you're still, man, what's that irritation? And it makes you concentrate, focus on that irritation. That's about spurring, spurring. It makes you focus on something that God is saying, hello, focus on it. My Holy Spirit is trying to convict you through this irritation. And, it, and all of a sudden, and you know, somebody comes up to me and they're scratching. And I'm like, how long have you had that? <laughs> oh man, it's been there a month. Hello? Go to a doctor. Don't be around me with that thing. If you want me to pray for it, I'll pray for it, but do something about it. Don't just keep scratching. You're making it worse. But it irritates. Hello? Get some beautiful ointment. Google it. Do something. <laughs> Fix the problem. You're focused on it. Fix it. That's what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us. I'm spurring you on to be an irritation so you'll focus on the problem. People miss that. And the Bible is so clear that he wants us or him, he spurs us on so we can spur each other on. Because why? The day is approaching. The day is approaching. Jesus Christ is coming back real soon. The day is approaching. That's something to get excited about. Jesus Christ, he's going to take us out of this wicked, wicked place. Oh, man. You know, even if Jesus doesn't come in my time, I'm still going to be excited because that's our hope is in Jesus Christ. Man, you can have your hope in your pocketbook. You can have your hope in your finances. You can have your hope in whatever. I don't put no hope in none of that. There's only one that deserves to have hope in it, that is Jesus Christ. What irritates you? There's all kinds of things that irritate me. One of the things that irritates me is when Tammy interrupts me. <laughs> it's funny. It's been going on for like only 38 years, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I am, I'm really exaggerating, okay? <laughs> She's sitting right there. I don't even want to look at her. <laughs> But no, I went to her, I thought, and I didn't even think I was going to use this today, and I probably shouldn't, but anyway, <laughs> here I am, let's go for it. But I didn't even think I was going to use this, and I went to her, and I said, um, it, something's irritating me. I try to talk, and you're interrupting me. Do I talk slow? Too slow for you? And here I am, I'm trying to fix it. I'm literally trying to ask her for advice so I can do better. And uh, she goes, well, something, sometimes I just know what you're going to say, so I say it for you. <laughs> and I know nobody else has that problem. <laughs> but I told her, I said, I feel like I have this big sign on my chest. Interrupt me. But it just irritates me. But I found myself going to her, having a good conversation with her, trying to fix the problem. And I didn't think about it until after it was done. I thought, well, that's a good thing. Trying to fix the problem with irritation. So what is irritating you when God spurs you on with truth? When your pastor is preaching the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ, what all of a sudden irritates you? Or when you're hearing a gospel message, what irritates you? 
One of the things when I go to my mom and dad's house now and Papa's over there and taking care of him and so on, and he's watching Billy Graham. Wow, what a preacher. He wasn't a, he just wasn't a, a soft talk. He just slammed it and hit it and spoke the gospel like it should be spoken. And man, you're, you're, you're hearing this. I, I love it because there's all of a sudden, oh, that irritated me right there. That truth just irritated me. Now I have the choice to turn him off or to bend my knee. Understand, there, with irritation, there's two things. One of two things that it will lead to when you're spurred on by truth and it starts to irritate you. You will find the ointment to heal it and you'll humble yourself and be obedient to that doctor that's saying, this is what you need to do. Or you will reject it and you will embrace pride. We know what happened to Lucifer. He became prideful. He was kicked out of heaven. But Jesus humbled himself from glory, came to this earth to seek and save us. He didn't have to. But he says, I'm the source. I'm here. But it's your choice. And so when people are spurred on, no matter if it's a godly mom, a godly father, a pastor, a radio pastor, a TV pastor, you just reading the word, when we're spurred on by God's truth, it's either going to do one or the other. So what irritates you? I want to spur you on in something. And I'm intentionally wanting to talk about this right now. Me, I'm a pastor. Pastors have a rep for talking about this. Evangelists have a rep for talking about it. So I want to be your irritation. I want to talk about money right now. In fact, if I was bold enough, I'd say, I'm going to take another offering right now. <laughs> but I'm not. But no, I want to talk about money right now. Because I literally want to irritate some people. And it's so easy for me to talk about money because my foundation isn't finances. My foundation isn't built on money. My foundation, I, I could give a rip about all that. You know, you gain the whole world, you lose your soul. So I have never a problem talking about this, but People have a problem when pastors talk about money. And I get it. A lot of pastors out there or, or evangelists have abused it. But I'm only doing it to see who's irritated. Because see, money has been man and woman's God forever. It's been their idol forever. Can you imagine people just bowing down to a piece of paper? Literally, that's all it is, is a piece of paper. I get excited for territory offering. May 5th, I get excited for territory offering. I get excited to, to see the lost change, to see people uh, touched and blessed by Gateway and so on and so on and so on. So every year, I didn't think it was going to be today, but I'm going to share what Tammy and I are going to give. Every year we share. I share it to let you know I put what I speak I want to put into action. I want to try to lead. Tammy and I, for year after year, we've been trying to get to a certain amount. And this, this year, we want to give $10,000 to territory. Is it a sacrifice? And is it a sacrifice? No, because God deserves everything of me. Everything of me. And Tammy and I have no problem. We give over 30% of the income and we're uh, straining and straining and straining to give more and more and more. It's a blessing. I love that. 
It's, it's so awesome. But that's coming up May 5th. Now, who's irritated? See, Jesus talked about money. He, he talked about how some will be blessed and some will be cursed. The ones that are blessed have a cheerful heart. The ones that end up being cursed, they're irritated, and it goes to pride. And he talks about how it becomes their idol. And that's why God, for years, God has told me to do double tithe Sunday. Is double tithe in the Bible? No, it's double tithe not in the Bible. Basically, in the Bible, what it says, give everything. Be thankful just for the little bit. But what Jesus is here talking about is how it can irritate some people. And he's saying in Matthew 6, 19, do not store up for yourselves. You notice that word, yourselves. God is all about you. He's all about looking out for you. He's all about giving you financial advice for you. People don't see it that way. I see it that way. This life is coming to an end. I could die on the way home today and I, that's it. This life is like a steam of vapor, according to James, and it's here and gone. We see people living and dying all the time. Some people young, some people old. In a moment, and he's trying to give us financial advice here right now. And he's saying, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where malls, vermin do not destroy. Where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure, and this is where it comes down to, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Is that an irritation? And what he's trying to constantly talk about here is, especially to the church of Jesus Christ, especially to those that get it, and he is saying, you once used to spend your money on your pleasures. You once used to spend your money on meaningless things that are rusted and the moths can come in and eat them. It's just meaningless. But now that you've received Jesus Christ, you have been born again. Do you know what that means? We've just had two little grandbabies been born for the first time a few months ago. Born again, new fresh start, new creation. Everything is new. And he's told us we've been born again. It's all new. Now the mind has to change. But if it's an irritation, then you are the ones with the problem. If God is spurring you on through his word and saying, there has to be a change of mind. No longer spending like the world has spent, like you used to do in the world, but now it's a new thinking. It's for his kingdom. It's for his glory. And some just don't get that. That's okay. But if it irritates you, find the solution for healing. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. And I haven't heard about this or that or people getting mad at me. Well, some people have gotten mad at me lately. But I haven't heard about people leaving the church or nothing like that. That's not anything to do with this message. But see, some people, they just stay in their irritation. And then they leave to try to find the perfect church. See, when you're reading the Bible or when you're listening to your pastor and things start to irritate you, understand that's the Holy Spirit spurring you on because I have just spurred you on. And all of a sudden, God will say things to me. And sometimes they'll be in different services that I, won't, I might say in the first that I won't say in the second. 
Rodney will come to me later and say, man, Pastor, I just felt like you preached a whole different sermon. I said, because God was telling me for a certain group of people that he loves so much to spur them on. And I don't understand that. I just want to be obedient to it. And so understand that it comes down as the Holy Spirit is, his Holy Spirit's conviction is stirring in us through that irritation, whatever it may be. It comes down to a heart issue. I don't know why people have a problem with me talking about alcohol, but I love talking about how alcohol, get free from alcohol, and I'm telling you, you will be free indeed. I loved what the speaker last week said. She lived it. Alcohol and adultery go hand in hand. She said that. Tammy and I, we've never lived that life. I have just seen it full of destruction. But why is it when God speaks to me to talk about alcohol, to spur people on, people don't like it? Because I have touched your little idol. And you're, you're pointing the finger at me. Instead of saying, oh, Holy Spirit, what are you doing in me? Oh, Holy Spirit, I embrace this. I've never seen a home, literally never seen a home that mom and dad get consumed with alcohol. And, and that's, that, that, that is good for the children. I've never seen good come out of that. And we don't live in Israel. Back in 2,000 years ago when the water was bad? No, shoot. Open up the tap water. Get a bottle of water. We have, we're so blessed here. There's no excuse. There's only one excuse to, to have alcohol, and that is to, to make you feel a little bit better with a buzz. Am I preaching truth or what? It goes back to that scripture I shared with you. What is righteous living? And then people will say, well, I can handle it. You can't handle squat. You know, people say, well, I can handle money and I can handle this. I can, no, no, man, woman can't handle nothing. Why is that? We're imperfect. Don't put yourself on the same level of Jesus Christ. We're imperfect. We're not made to handle these things. Tammy and I, we spoke to a beautiful circle group last Thursday, the Mary, Young Mary's group, being run by uh, Brandon and um, uh, oh, Clarissa. Clarissa. <laughs> Only known her 26 years. Uh, B and big, we call them Big B and Clarissa. I call her CZ, but. Um, and I, we started off saying, how to have a good marriage, you first have to purpose in your heart what kind of marriage you want. You have to purpose in your heart, we want this type of marriage. Is it going to be a godly marriage? Is it going to be mixed with world and God? Is it going to be a worldly marriage? Is it going to be a, just a sports-centered marriage? What kind of marriage are you going to purpose in your heart, both of you? You have to purpose in your heart as a Christ follower. What kind of life are you going to live? What kind of standards are you going to have? Don't you think that pastor has temptations to live this or live that, but I won't because I know where it goes? Don't you think anybody and everybody have had these temptations to want to indulge in this and that? But God says, no. God brings an irritation. And I say, oh, Lord, give me the, give me the oil. Give me the ointment. I want this healed. I, it's your way, not mine. To embrace the conviction of God brings blessings. To embrace that uh, irritation brings something so vital to our lives. It's brings a beautiful pearl of blessing. Lift up your pearl. 
If you don't have one, steal it from your neighbor. I wish I could give you a real pearl, but this is as cheap as you can get. I think I got a thousand of them for, on Amazon for $13.99. Oh, yeah. And, but it's what it represents. Because, see, with a pearl, the way a pearl is formed, from, it's formed from irritation. Within an oyster, when a tiny piece of sand gets inside the shell, layer by layer of mucus is built up around the irritation until there's a beautiful, beautiful, shiny, lustrous pearl. And it takes anywhere from six months to four years to form that pearl. Some things you're not going to get just overnight. Some things I didn't get in the beginning overnight. In the beginning when I would hear, when I was early living in, under my mom and dad's roof, and my dad said, it's going to be this way. I'm like, as a teenager, I don't get you. I don't understand that. It's going to be different when I'm a father. Guess what? I became my dad. <laughs> Sorry to tell you. It all the same. It all translates the same. I didn't get it, but what he was getting was he loved me more than I loved him at the time. He loved me so much that he didn't want me to take down a certain path that was going to lead wrong. And it sometimes just takes time. Time. But if you stay obedient, if you stay submissive, during that irritation, find the healing for the rash, for the irritation. Don't jump ship and try to find a teacher that will float your boat. It's right here in the name of Jesus Christ, your word, your Bible. And understand, he loves you. Everything that he writes in his word, he's saying, I know it irritates you, but I know the best for you. You know what I, who I love to irritate the most? And no, it's not Tammy. But when we spur on each other with truth, church, I'm talking to you right now. You call yourself a Christ follower, then perk up your ears. I'm talking to the church of Jesus Christ right now. When we stand together, and when we take what the word of God has called us to take and we spur each other on in our marriages, in our families, in our, out there in the world, in our workplaces, wherever maybe, when we spur one another on, I tell you, Satan gets ticked off. I love irritating Satan. You know, you know the only way to give, amen. I love he hates my soul. He hates your soul. And he, through God's word, God's truth, as we spur each other on, as we spur even the world on, and there will be these that finally, you, every time they're around you, why do I feel irritated? Why do I feel irritated every, every time I'm around Jeff? Well, it's the glory of God's anointing that surrounds us as people that are living righteous for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? I tell you, you go into that family unit, you go into Thanksgiving, that you go into Easter coming up, whatever it may be, you, all of a sudden you get around the world, even if they're family members. The anointing of God will be on you as a Christ follower. And it irritates the darkness. It irritates Satan. I'll never forget, years ago, somebody came to me and said, I want you to stop having altar calls. First of all, who let you in my office? I want you to stop having altar calls. And I said, so you're God? Yeah, everybody is saved here. Okay, well, first of all, you can leave the church, and I'm not going to stop having altar calls, and this happened 26, 25 years ago, shortly after Tammy and I came here, 
And they stopped having altar calls years before me. Stopped inviting uh, the world to accept Jesus Christ. And I, that's what I'm called to. I'm called to this world. Seek and save the lost. Like Jesus Christ, he was called to the world. That is our mission. We are commissioned in that mission for our Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, well, I'm not going to stop it. And see, what was irritating is because before that person came to me, and as I started opening up the altars, we started having revivals. People started getting saved. People started coming in from the outside. And there's something that's going on in the church. Yeah, we're irritating Satan, and he doesn't like it. People are getting saved for the glory of God. Satan hates truth. Every time in the wilderness, if you read that story, when Jesus was in the wilderness, 40 days, 40 nights, what, every time uh, Satan came against Jesus and tempted him, would he come back with his own opinion? No, he came back with the word of the awesome God. And finally, Satan could not combat against us. He got irritated, and he didn't say that Jesus left. No, Satan left. Because the word irritates Satan. The truth of Jesus Christ irritates Satan. And I want you to know something. My life is crazy. I've irritated Satan ever since we've been here. And God, it's not me. It's God's message flowing through us. As a couple, as individuals, as a family, as a staff, and so on. And man, my, 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 I've been threatened to be thrown in jail. I've been, I've been, uh, my, my character has been threatened. Uh, you know, it goes on and on. And I'm like, darkness, if my fruit doesn't speak for itself, then whatever. You can do what you want to me. You can do what you say what you want. You can say what you want about my family. You can say what you want about God's service. But guess what? I'm going to speak the truth of the living Savior. Nothing. Nothing. You can be irritated all day long. But God has called us here to speak his truth, to spur you on, to spur this world on. And some of them, they're irritated. And man, my wife sent me this. I loved it. This is when she could tell I was a little discouraged and she brought some encouraging. Man, she sent me this about an eagle and a crow. I love it. The only bird that dares to peck an eagle is the crow. It sits on his back and bites his neck. The eagle does not respond, nor fight with the crow. It does not spend time or energy on the crow. It just opens its wings and begins to rise higher and higher and higher into the heavens. The higher the flight, the harder it is for the crow to breathe than the crow falls due to lack of oxygen. Learn from the eagle and don't fight the crows. Just keep ascending in Jesus until they'll fall off. I want you to know sometimes people on social media are a bunch of crows. The more you soar in Jesus and you irritate Satan, you irritate the world, the more they're going to come back at you. But as you keep soaring, those demons will fall right off because they can't go to the levels that you can in Jesus Christ. I love... Love that scripture, Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord. Will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Let's be eagles for God. No matter when we spur on, no matter what comes against us, let's stay like eagles for God. Let's keep soaring, soaring, soaring. But when that irritation comes, 
Jesus has the best ointment for you. He'll heal it. He'll heal it. But you got to be obedient. And men, listen to me. You might think of an irritation sometimes, but God has given you a beautiful wife to speak to you. And in most situations, men, most situations, the wife that God has given you is a gift from God. Let her speak into you, even though it might irritate you. I get it. Tammy will speak truth to me, and it will touch the manhood or that part in me sometimes. And I don't want her to speak about my weaknesses. But then all of a sudden I come back around and say, thank you, because you were right on. Because she loves us. Your wife loves you. And I don't know why God is telling me to tell you that, but I don't know who that's for, but that's what God's telling me to tell you. Because men, men can be full of themselves. Men, when you humble yourself, when you find that beautiful ointment, you're obedient to God. Oh, blessings will fall upon your marriage. Blessings will fall upon your home. Blessings will fall upon you as a man. Please take that. Take that from the Lord. And I don't know what situation is going on, but God wants us to be open when we're spurred on in truth by our God. I'd like for you to bow your heads with me. And I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ, whatever that situation is in your heart, maybe... Right now, you don't know Jesus Christ. Maybe you're online and you have tried everything else like so many of us. But there's only one, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can save you. So today, I encourage you to open your heart. On this campus, if you hear my voice, I encourage you, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, if he has not, if you have not allowed him to save your soul, maybe you did a while ago or maybe you did years ago, but man, you have gotten off track and you need to repent of your ways. Today is that day. Today, even you as Christ followers, There's an irritation. You started feeling irritation, this or that or whatever it may be, or the Holy Spirit started to quicken your thinking to make you think about certain things. Take that as a gift from God. And today, humble yourself. And also that you say, oh God, that I open my heart up to be spurred by your truth. If that's you today, I just encourage you, whatever situation it is, just lift that hand up and say, Pastor, remember me in prayer right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So many hands, thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, thank you, thank you. God loves when he sees those hands, he looks right in your heart. Thank you, sir, thank you. Anyone else? It's all about a heart issue. God is after your heart. Thank you. Thank you back there. Anybody else? Anybody else? Shall we all stand up together? God right now, in this prayer, how many believe in the name of Jesus Christ, God is, is going to break whatever that irritation, whatever that situation is. He's going to bring submission. He's going to bring obedience. He's going to bring a blessing. That stubbornness, God's going to break it. That pride, God's going to break it. Humility, whatever that is, I know it only takes in a fraction of a second, say the name of Jesus. Oh, demons flee in the name of Jesus. It's just powerful. 
He's given us that authority today in his name. He loves this. So I know in Jesus' name this is going to happen. Let's just repeat this prayer off after me, all of us to do it. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you for the cross. It's through the cross that I have salvation. It's through Jesus you have taken the blood and you have washed my sins away. Thank you, dear Jesus. You have thrown it into the sea of forgetfulness, not to hold it against me. And through you, dear Jesus, I give my heart, I give my mind, and I give my soul. Lord, thank you for the irritation. Thank you to spur me on. And now I give it unto you. Father, Lord, right now I just pray for each and every one. And dear Lord, in your name, God, that pride falls off. In your name, that individual is bathed in humility to Jesus. In your name right now, God, they're, they're on a new course. A new course for you, dear Jesus. And dear Lord, by the mention of your name, miracles happen. Healings happen. And in your name, we thank you for it. In your precious name, and everybody said, Amen. Give it to our Lord.